A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week. What kind of a person hides in the basement of his family's home pretending to be a good looking guy who had just won the lottery? And then he plans a hideous, hideous plot to kill a girl with special needs just for the fun of it. The teen that he manipulated really did it, really killed her. They thought that they were getting $9 million for this murder. Well, this loser has been sentenced to 99 years in prison. And as he walked out of the court, the girl's father told him, I hope you rot in hell. But first... What possesses a man to write a letter to a 17-year-old daughter instructing her not to have any relationships with any other man except for her father? Ludicrous, right? Well, the man's mother thought so. She was so concerned for her granddaughter's safety that she was planning to take the teen out of this situation. Well, police say that the father didn't like that. Police say he shot at his mother, at his daughter, and killed a family friend. We are recording this on Wednesday, January 31st of 2024. Our guest today is Philip Hamilton, a New York attorney, managing partner at Hamilton Clark LLP, and a dear friend of the show. Philip, it's always great to see you. How are you? Anna, such a pleasure to be with you as always. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm always glad as, um, you know, you're referred to the New York guys <laughs> join us. We always like the perspective, trying to get a full perspective on crime. So um, our first case, I got to well, they're both really disturbing, Philip. And I always say this is about people's behavior. Crime is about decisions that people make when they're in a situation that they don't like, right? And they make really bad decisions. I'm not talking about stealing because you need money or, or do you know what I mean? We're I mean talking about deliberate acts to harm another individual somehow you think this is a good idea. It, it, this won't be the first time that I'll be with you, Anna, that we'll be talking about people's terrible, terrible decisions and the consequences that, you know, it has for others, for families. Uh, you know, there's always you know, that great part of seeing you and coming on here and being a part of the show. But, you know, there are times where we just have to like delve into the weeds of just some really, really, really sad stories that are typically a result of just people's terrible, terrible decision making. Terrible. Terrible. So this first case is out of Tampa, Florida, where a man apparently lost it after his teen daughter refused to date him. Okay, let's just begin with this insanity. Under no circumstances is a father supposed to be in a relationship, a romantic relationship. You know, this is incestuous with his daughter and the fact that his daughter obviously had a problem with it and his own mother thought, what are you nuts? He, this is the seed of the conflict. And the thing is, from the very beginning, it's wrong. This man was in the wrong the entire time. I mean, you say incestuous. Let's just, we don't have to be euphemistic about it. It's sick. You know, there's something wrong with this man. And fortunately, you know, for his his, his mother and, and his daughter, they were actually within the right minds to know that this is wrong, that it's not okay. And, you know, unfortunately, this sick individual, you talk about making some terrible decisions. You know, a woman has ended up dead because of this relationship that this father, and I'm going to use that word in quotes, this father is trying to pursue with his own daughter. It's, it, it's sick. It is sick. Nothing short of sick. Police say that Michael Banks, who's 42 years old, has admitted to shooting his 17-year-old daughter, his 60-year-old mother, and his mother's friend, Josephine Muentes, who was 52 years old. This is after he allegedly tried to start and initiate some kind of an intimate relationship with his daughter. And these are words that are not applicable. Again, an illegal relationship. None of these. This is you cannot have this kind of relationship with your daughter. So his mother and his daughter survived. But Josephine died of her injuries. And at the time of the incident. OK, so here we have Michael who's living with his mother. OK, Michael, you're 42 years old. You're living with your mother. Says enough okay. in and of itself, but go ahead. Says enough. 
He's also a convicted felon. He was not supposed to be, he wasn't allowed to own a firearm, and we're going to get into the details of this whole firearm thing. Um, So he's a convicted felon. He was convicted for aggravated battery on a pregnant woman in 2007, and then simple battery in 2010. Michael has some serious problems, and we are now adding to that list of attempted murder and murder charges. Okay, so clearly, this man has had nothing but trouble his whole life. But here you have his mother taking him in, right? So many opportunities to change your life around. Okay, so here's what started the whole thing was this letter. Police say that Michael wrote a letter to a 17-year-old daughter. She's not been named, and the mother's name has not been released as well. And that Michael wanted to be in a romantic relationship with his daughter. According to police, he admitted to writing this letter, insisting that she enter into a relationship with him and date no one else. This is crazy-making. Crazy-making. So then what the teen does, she does the right thing. She tells on her father. She goes straight to Michael's own mother, her grandmother. The grandmother is shocked at this news. It's like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. She turns to her best friend, Josephine Muentes, and and the women are talking. The women are talking, this is according to police. They're talking and, and the grandmother says, well, I need to take my granddaughter out of the situation or maybe I should kick Michael out of the house. This is the conversation. Michael, police say, is hearing this and loses it when he hears that his own mother, in his mind, is turning against him when all she's doing is the right thing. So then he goes and he grabs a gun. Here's where it's really murky for me, Philip, Mm -hmm. because apparently, according to Florida law, the kind of revolver he had is considered more of an antique gun so a so possession of it it's considered vintage antique is not considered breaking the conditions of his release however if you use said gun in the commission of a crime then it is a violation this is a little bit murky for me does that make sense to you no i mean not from a well listen yes actually it does right because like from a state law perspective i mean if we just think about Let's just start and think about like the Florida state legislature. Right. And we won't have to get into like a lot of laws that have been of controversy, you know, that Florida has been passing as of recent. But we can certainly objectively say it's a gun friendly state. Right. So, of mm-hmm. course, there are going to be these exceptions that are made when this kind of legislation comes through, because, you know, for instance, at the federal level. Right. Which, frankly, the feds still could potentially come in because if he was, a, as you mentioned, a convicted felon from the past, he served time on an offense that would have allowed for more than one year incarceration. The feds could totally come in and charge him with a federal being a felon in possession of a firearm, right? For violating the federal statute. You know, I guess from a state statute standpoint, the gun lobby probably in Florida wrote in, you know, this exception or these few minor exceptions to, you know, deal with these antique guns or these novelty guns. But to me, it doesn't really make sense, particularly when an antique gun or a novelty gun can still kill as they did here, right? That's the whole point behind why generally this legislation is passed where you don't want felons in possession of firearms. It's so that they can't kill anyone, particularly when they've shown a proclivity to, you know, engage in criminal activity in the past. That's the whole point. So the exceptions don't really make sense. And here's a tragic you know, incident and situation where we've seen it, it, it's kind of nonsensical to put that ex- exception in because now, unfortunately, this woman's dead. Exactly. This is a prime example of how that didn't, as long as it's a functioning weapon in this case, I mean, he was able to load it. I mean, there was no question. Not only did he kill one, well, he is charged with killing one person. He is charged with shooting his mother right. and shooting and his, his daughter. daughter and then is in a, a gun battle with police. So clearly it's a functioning weapon. And I mean, there's there, it's possible when someone is determined to do something in there, you know, in this fit and in a rage, he could have still harmed all of them. I'm not saying um, that the only way to have harmed people was through a gun, but Correct. I just found this loophole so fascinating because it is a functioning weapon. Okay, so Michael goes and grabs this revolver, which he has to, you know, 
load very specifically. The, the mother claims that her back was turned. So it, her back was to her son when her son shot Josephine, her friend, in the head. This is what she told police. So the mother now watches her friend collapse on the floor. And then the mother tells police her own son raises the gun at her and shoots at her head. She says... Thank God it grazed her head. She was still injured, but it grazed her head. She ran out the door and she calls 911. So this is about a quarter to one in the afternoon that this is all happening. Then the teenage daughter, she's in the house. She's apparently taking a shower. She tells police she's in the shower. She hears the shots being fired and she tries to, you know, protect herself by you know, locking the door and holding the door against her dad trying to break in. She tells police her father randomly shot through the door, but toward her head, misses her, misses her. Then when she tries to run out the house, she says her father shot her in the leg. Insanity. And it doesn't end there. And it doesn't end there. Police then say he runs outside Police are already on the scene by the time he runs outside. And then he gets into a gun battle with police officers. Fortunately, no one outside was injured. He finally, Michael, finally surrenders, puts down his weapon, and he's been booked into the the jail. He's facing first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder with a firearm, attempted first-degree murder of an officer, with a firearm, along with a long count of now adding possession of a firearm as a felon because he used it allegedly in the commission of a crime. Right. What do you do with this case? I wouldn't take it. I mean, like, let's <laughs> let's start there, right? There's people that come into the office at times and, you know, they want consultations. You know, I'm not even going to say on facts as crazy as this that just kind of morally, philosophically don't really line up with kind of how we approach defense within the law. Um, So start there. I I guess if for whatever reason I did end up, uh, say, assigned to the case or something like that, if I was a public defender, I guess going back to what you and I initially discussed, I got to figure out what's wrong with this guy. I need to get a forensic psychiatrist in to do a very thorough and substantive evaluation as to what's going on clearly there's some anger issues there with women right if we look back at those offenses from earlier the the battery against the pregnant woman right these issues you so you are still living with your mother so again at 42 years old we're going to presume something's not all the way right that you're not out of the house yet taking care of yourself and whatever resentment maybe has built up over the years whatever anger is there you're, you're you're abusing your daughter coming at her not just shooting her in the leg but psychologically trying to put her in a relationship with you or propositioning her. It's, yeah, I'm a father. I, I can't even imagine. It's, it's, it's sick, right? And maybe there's some kind of diagnosis within there that can somewhat help us all understand. I'm not saying excuse, but help right. us understand what the motivations are with this man. And then you just take it from there. And maybe you try to mitigate, you know, whatever time it is that he's going to serve. You present that to the court. You present that evaluation to the prosecution. And and, and maybe you can kind of come to some deal to just resolve this before anybody else further has to get hurt. Like, God forbid, his daughter's got to come in and testify against him. His mother's got to come in and testify against him. Don't put them through that with everything else that you've already put them through. Just get yourself evaluated, take some accountability, and then let's see if we could potentially resolve the case. That's what I would say maybe you can do, but I mean, we'll, we'll see. Do you find it interesting that Michael's attorney, um, when he had his first hearing after arrest, Michael's attorney did not contest the motion by prosecutors to deny his bail that his attorney was like, yeah, I think maybe that's where that's where Michael should be. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, even if he's not coming from the place of that's where Michael should be, that's where he will be. There's right. there's no way you're getting him out. There's no argument you're going to put forth that's going to make any judge that's worried about their own election cycle coming up. Nobody's releasing him. Right. So to the extent that that's not going to happen and that's not realistic, why even put forth the argument. And so I think he didn't, they consented and they'll just kind of take it from there. Oh, what a horrible case. So disturbing on so many levels when you have really the women in his life 
trying to do the right thing to keep the teen safe as possible, right? All the women in his life trying to do the right thing here. Mm -hmm. And Michael just doesn't get it. When you love someone, you protect them in the best ways that you can. That's why I recommend Simply Safe Home Security. It's an advanced system that protects every inch of your home and backed by 24 7 professional monitoring for fast emergency response for less than a dollar a day. One of the best parts about Simply Safe is that it's easy to use. It's not overly complicated like some other security systems out there. And if you don't want to set it up yourself, that's no problem. You can get one of their expert technicians to come over to your house and install it for you. Piece of cake. Simply Safe is trusted by experts. It was named Best Home Security Systems of 2024 by US News and World Report. And Simply Safe offers everything that you need for the whole home protection. So HD cameras for indoors and outdoors, advanced motion sensors and entry sensors to protect the doors, the windows, and all the rooms, plus a collection of hazard sensors that detect fire, flooding, and more. Simply Safe is powered by 24-7 professional monitoring. So whenever your home is threatened, trained agents spring into action for emergency dispatch and response Again, all for under a dollar a day. Order now to get 20% off of any new Simply Safe system with fast protect monitoring. Don't wait. Visit simplysafe.com slash true crime. That's simplysafe.com slash true crime. There is no safe like Simply Safe. Our next case is out of Anchorage, Alaska. It is a case that we've been following here on the podcast. It is one that breaks my heart. Um, because the target here was a girl with special needs, a young woman who had learning challenges, um, a young woman who was desperate to have a friend. And when she finally thought she made one, her father said she was the happiest girl ever. And anyone who has ever struggled with trying to connect with another human being and trying to make a friend or has felt lonely and then finally finds a friend, I think every single person can understand the level of joy that one feels when you finally make that one friend. You know, you don't have to be a parent to understand this feeling. And so to have someone who so desperately wanted a friend and then to have that friend be part of this horrible plot to kill her, this level of betrayal, it's just, it's like it's injury upon injury and, and, and it's taking advantage of the vulnerable. Oh, I can't, I, this, this case makes me ill. Anna, you're a, you're a mom, right? So, I mean, just the way that you just articulated it, uh, you know, your kid starts kindergarten or they're somewhere throughout the course of elementary school. Maybe they're having a hard time making friends. Like once you start to see that they're like opening up, letting people in, developing relationships. Yeah, it, it warms your heart. Right. And to be in the place where that all of a sudden gets flipped, you hear that your daughter who has had these disabilities, who does finally like form a bond or relationship with another. And then that person ends up savagely killing them. I can't imagine. God no. bless the parents. No, it, you know, making a friend can be a life-changing experience. Yeah. And in this case, it was a life-ending experience. And, and the horror that this young woman had to endure in the last few minutes of her life, there is no excuse for this. There is no explanation for this. There should be no mercy for this. I will tell you what happened. But I guess it is an explanation. But this will also upset you when you hear just the insanity and how ludicrous this whole thing was. So 19-year-old Cynthia Hoffman, she was tricked, she was targeted, and she was murdered as part of this online catfishing plot. She is not the one who befriended anyone online. She is an innocent victim in all of this. Her killers thought that they were going to make $9 million for killing her and recording this. 
really? On what planet are you living that this is really an offer that you're going to get $9 million and that's the price tag you put on a human life? I, like, I, I don't, I, we're older, mature people. Like, I don't, where, how are you going to get the money? How, do you have accounts? Is it getting wired to you? Just start to think through the bullet points of how unrealistic this is and to, you know, actually go forward with this plot beyond I mean, I, I, right I no one can comprehend this i mean no one and and we're we're not you know they were all teenagers they weren't babies right. this isn't like you know saying that this is a 12 year old that was manipulated there's a big difference between a 12 year old and a teen an adult right. teen and some of them were minors you know not of age but this is like this is like really ludicrous okay so the person who planned this whole thing was in a basement in Indiana, and he's finally been brought to justice. This was his plan. He initiated this. He set the ball rolling. He supported and he pushed, and he has been sentenced to 99 years in prison. Good. Good. Absolutely good. May a rotten hell, like Cynthia's dad said to him. The victim, 19-year-old Cynthia Hoffman, who often went by the nickname Cece, she had worked through her developmental challenges. You know, yes, she longed for friends and to belong. We totally can understand that for any human being. You know, she lived with her father, Timothy Hoffman, who was a handyman, worked a lot of construction, and he always helped his daughter learn skills in construction. So she was incredibly handy herself. She, this learning disability she had did not stop her. In 2018, she graduated from service high school with the skills she needed to work on construction sites with her dad. Okay. okay. So here's a strong young woman finding her place in the world. And Timothy, her dad, always called Cynthia his right-hand man. Okay. So now let's get to the perpetrators here. Darren Schillmiller, according to authorities, lived in the basement of his grandparents' home in Indiana. No job, no life. Troll the internet for victims. He pretended to be a good-looking guy named Tyler who had won the lottery. This is what he was telling people. And that he was going to pay someone $9 million to sexually assault a human being, videotape it, and then kill a person. Darren according to authorities, consumed some of the most violent of child sex abuse videos and photos. So violent, I cannot repeat what is in the court record. Mm. It is unimaginable against the youngest of children. Against the youngest of children. And a whole, not that it goes to in any way undercutting or anything along those lines, just the, the, the horrible acts that have happened here. But how old is this guy? He was 21 at the time of the commission of this crime. Okay. So old enough to know better, without Definitely. question. Definitely. Young, we know the brain is still forming. Young people don't always make the best decisions. But this is beyond a bad decision. So Darren, as he's trolling, finds a young woman named Denali Bremer. Now, she was 18 at the time. Okay. And she went along with this because she thinks this Tyler guy, and he's got a whole other photo up there of a good-looking guy, she thinks Tyler might be her ticket out, right? Good-looking guy, he's a millionaire, won the lottery, he's interested in me, I just have to do some really horrible, disgusting, illegal things, and then Tyler and I will, like, be together. Yeah, I don't know what was going on in her brain that she thought Tyler was the ticket out. So Denali's now friends with Cece, with Cynthia. And Cynthia has no idea of this plot. She has no idea of this plot. And videos, photos, and obviously the communications between Darren in the basement in Indiana and Denali, the, the girl who he contacted and tricked, there's a lot of evidence because he insisted on photographic evidence of things. 
Mm. Very sick. Very, very sick. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I just, it, the whole thing just, just undoes me. Just undoes me. So let's get to the weekend of Cynthia's disappearance. So it was June 2nd, 2019. And Cynthia was supposed to go to the mall. She was going to go. She had been working with her dad. She was going to go to the mall with her sister. Dad had given them a little money to go have fun, do a little shopping. Yep. But she doesn't come back. She, she doesn't, the next day, she is missing. So her dad, Timothy, goes on the news, makes a plea, please help me find my daughter. Um, and here's the timing of everything. Before we get into what happened to Cynthia, this is crucial, crucial to, to police figuring out what happened. Okay. He goes on television and makes this plea. Denali's biological mother she was given up for adoption at 18 months and about six months prior to this whole thing had reconnected with her biological mother the biological mother is watching television and she's like oh my god hold on a second my daughter just came to me with her friend and told me this outrageous story and it sounds like it involves this young woman who's missing so the biological mom calls the police and then tells her, tells the police about this crazy story about $9 million to kill someone. Like the mother didn't know what to make of this. Like none of this made any sense. And she, in essence, turns in her daughter and the friend as she should have, Mm -hmm. as she should have. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what the mother told the police that had been told to her by Denali. And, And this is crucial here. She tells authorities her daughter came to her and said that someone had offered her $9 million for a video of her and her friends killing and torturing someone. Denali said that the plan was to take their friend Cynthia to Thunderbird Falls. They were, here's the plan. I guess they thought they could outsmart the guy in the basement. They were going to fake it. They were going to tie up Cynthia and make it seem like they had tortured her and killed her and not do it and get the $9 million. And what happens here, Philip? It goes terribly wrong. Why? Because when they tie up Cece, when they gag her and they tie her up, she freaks out, right? She freaks out as anyone would. And then if you have any challenges, how in the world are you going to process this information? Right. Why are your friends tying you up? Right. I don't even know how much of that, frankly, to believe this. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. If, if, if it's going to be that route, then and, and, and you're planning on scamming the catfisher, right? Oh. Then let your friend in on it. Let Cynthia in on it. Right. Like, let's play this up. Right. Like, let's act out your death. Let's all get this nine million dollars and and go on with our life. And so to the extent that she's not let in, like, I don't I, I don't know. I don't know how much I believe that part. Right. That like, I there's, agree. oh, she freaked out. Like, I think they unfortunately probably just took her out there, killed her execution style. And then we're planning to, you know, just move forward with the transaction and 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 get the money or, or, or do whatever she was going to do. This is just like an evil, evil plot that they're even in their mitigation, right? And I know you're about to finish up mm-hmm. with how they tried to downplay this. The downplay is terrible. Even if it happened in the way in which they tried to downplay it, that's horrible. Yeah, you're right. Why not tell Cynthia this is what you're doing and give her the choice? Um, of course, if you tie someone up, they're going to freak out. And apparently, according to police, the initial reporting from the teens, if we are to believe them, that Cynthia got so upset, she said, I'm calling the police and I'm telling on you. And it is at that moment when she was shot. At that moment. And I do believe, you know, the most dangerous moments when a crime is being committed, especially a murder, is that moment when the secret is about to be revealed and you are so afraid of that secret being revealed that the worst decisions are made. 
And so this fits in line with that. I'm not saying that I buy it. I think it's, I don't think any of them were thinking clearly. So as dumb as that plan sounds, it is equally as dumb as the whole thing. You know, it's all bad. It's all a really bad idea. So remember that the biological mother is like listening to the story and thinking this, none of this makes any sense. But of course she connects them to police and then realizes something, something's not right here. Now we're up to June 4th. So the second, she goes to the mall. The third, she's not found. June 4th now, um, homicide detectives speak with Denali. Denali, according to detectives, says she was smoking weed with Cynthia and a boy named Caden McIntosh, who was then 16. Okay. Now, here's the thing. According to Denali, the three of them decided to duct tape each other, right? Take the photographs. And that's when Cynthia panicked, right? So they're, they're telling that whole story as is. Um, now, Caden, Caden, in this case so far, he has entered a plea of not guilty. He must be presumed innocent until his case goes to court. He has not entered a plea. So it's very important that we understand that police say this is what he said at the time. Plus there are, there's the testimony of Denali. And then there's the testimony, remember, of the biological mother who repeated everything that was told to her. So Mm -hmm. um, this case, while many have already entered pleas and and or have been sentenced, not everyone has. So I want to be really clear about that. So when the authorities interviewed Caden McIntosh, he, according to authorities, corroborated everything that the biological mother and Denali had said. Caden said he told authorities according to them, that he blacked out but remembered shooting Cynthia and then pushing her into the river. And again, he's pleaded not guilty. Philip, as a defense attorney, help me out here. The authorities say this is what he said at the time. He's pleaded not guilty. We don't know what direction his case will take. Right. What is the value of what he said especially when you put it into context that it seems to line up with everybody else's version of what happened. So the value for the authority? For the prosecution and also against him. Okay. So as against him, the the whole blackout part, there, people always try to do this. It's not going to do much for him because remember there's a bunch of conspiracy counts here correct like conspiracy Mm -hmm. to commit murder and so whether you were the trigger puller or not as long as the prosecution can hit you on a conspiracy which is basically legalese for two or more people coming together forming a plan to carry out an illicit act right and there is some kind of overt act that goes toward the carrying out of whatever illegal plan you've come up with. I mean, here he was with them all the way. He understood what the plan was before they went in, right? And even at like up to the point where you have the gun in your hand, whatever it is, like you're a part of this whole scheme. So there really is no getting out of it by saying that you blacked out. Um, In terms of pleading not guilty, probably at this point, just trying to buy some time to maybe work out some kind of lesser plea, or maybe sometimes by the time you're already facing 99 years or life, sometimes attorneys are just like, well, what do we have to lose by maybe going to trial and maybe getting some of the top counts knocked out and then you just get found guilty of some of the lesser offenses, right? Like, what do you have to lose? Is kind of what it comes to, right? Yeah. But I just think he will lose based on what he's already said. And I think the value for the prosecution in those statements, um, there's a lot less you and I have dealt with cases where like things happen in the woods and clearly there's no surveillance there and we don't know how said crime occurred and it makes it difficult at times for law enforcement or the prosecution to move forward on their matters. I mean, here it's a little less difficult because you already have something coming out of his mouth. Now, if he finds some kind of way legally to get that statement suppressed or something, maybe that's another reason as to why he's pleading not guilty at this point. Um, But even when you're trying to get a statement suppressed because it was illegally taken by law enforcement or maybe it wasn't voluntarily given, whatever it may be, 
you're still always swimming upstream in terms of just how difficult the case is on the defense side. And from the prosecutorial standpoint, I mean, they're sitting good. Plus the fact they've already gotten a bunch of convictions. They probably have people that would be ready to cooperate and come and testify against him. Uh, I don't really know what he's doing right now in terms of legal posturing, but it just doesn't look good for him. No, it doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. So after Denali and Caden allegedly told the police that they had pushed Cynthia's body into the creek, police searched that specific area and they found her body two days later. Mm. Just where they said it had happened. Cynthia's wrists and ankles were duct taped together. Hate that. I hate what happened to this. It's just a woman. terrifying way to, you know, we're all going to go at some point. None of us are trying to go like that, right? And just total fear and and no control of what happens with your life and just uh, to to just be taken out like you're nothing, right? Mm -hmm. like I, nothing. I hate that that's how she had to die. I know. Go into the mall, had a little money in her right. pocket. Do a Finally got a friend. Yeah. Finally got a friend, right? All the things that matter to a young woman. Yeah, breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. I hate this case. So once they found her body and then they had these alleged admissions, police obtained a search warrant for Denali's phone. And that is where the treasure trove of evidence, digital evidence, revealed itself and the plot, right? Because at first it sounded like, you know, you tell the police, yeah, I did this because I was going to get $9 million. And you're like, right, you're the cops. You're in Anchorage, Alaska. You're like, really? Until you start seeing the communications and you're like, oh, Lord, this is really complicated here. And there are more people involved. So... Officers found evidence on her phone of child pornography, which was embedded in text messages that she was exchanging with Tyler, the guy in the basement. And that's when authorities figured out that Tyler was really Darren Schillmiller of New Salisbury, Indiana. So he further complicated his, you know, we said he, he posed as um, a millionaire. So even though he's Indiana, um, he claimed that he was a millionaire from Kansas. And of course, he used a fake picture, the whole bogus story, and that you could see where Darren was encouraging and asking Denali to take sexually explicit photos and videos of underage victims. And this all intensified as their relationship grew. Mm. Authorities then find video evidence of a sexual assault perpetrated by Denali on a 15-year-old female victim. Darren, who was then 21, told the FBI agents, oh yeah, um, I offered her $9 million for the rape and murder of someone in Alaska. I, I just, I can't. Everything about this is horrific. On June 14th of 2019, an Anchorage grand jury indicted six suspects, including Darren Schillmiller, Denali Bremer, Caden McIntosh for Cynthia's murder. Additional person, Caleb Leland. He was then 19. He was named as a defendant because he allegedly allowed Denali and Caden to use his car to pick up Cynthia. Okay. Then there are two juveniles who have been charged, but their cases remained in juvenile court. Okay. A lot of people involved in this thing. A lot of people. And at what point, Philip, did one of these people just say, stop? They didn't. And if someone did, nobody listened. Clearly. Oh my goodness. Okay, so let's get back to Denali. This is the girl who betrayed Cynthia. Denali pleaded guilty to first-degree murder on February 15th. In exchange for the murder plea, prosecutors dropped the charges of conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation of murder, tampering with physical evidence, to additional charges of second-degree murder. And she is scheduled 
to be sentenced in two weeks. So she pled last February. She's scheduled in two weeks on February 12th to be sentenced. Prosecutors have asked for the maximum 99 years. I hope she gets it. Denali's mother, her biological mother, let's get back to her. She's a very important woman in this entire thing, honestly. So she's the one who turned in the teens. And she is the one who testified against her daughter in this case. She took the stand. And she did something we often don't see. We saw the parent of a killer stand up and articulate that her daughter must pay the price for taking a life. Rarely do we hear this level of humanity. Here's what the mother, Nicole House, told KTUU. I told her I loved her, because I do. I, she's still my daughter. Uh, but the choices that she made and the decisions that she, that she made put her in the position she's in right now. And when someone loses their life because of a decision you made, there's, there's got to be consequences for that. I think her mother is the only one making sense here. She is. I, you know, I just, I guess like in listening to that, the one thing maybe from the defense standpoint that they may, they may spend some time on like as they prepare for their sentencing memorandum and to make their sentencing arguments. I mean, look, I'm not trying to make excuses here, but I'm just trying to walk you through how the defense may think in terms of mitigation. This mother, as you said, they didn't really have a relationship for most of her life, right? She's adopted. And, you know, there may have just always been a sense of like not belonging, right? Maybe she had some attachment issues from like a younger age, right? And, you know, latching on to this Tyler, you know, this this sick individual in the basement in Indiana, right, was some really messed up way with which she was looking for love, right? And that Mm -hmm. she was looking for an attachment, right? Now, now I don't want everybody in the comments just saying, oh, you know, here Phil is trying to excuse. All I'm trying to say is that there's a variable there that the defense may explore as to how she got caught up in this evil, evil, evil scheme, right? And to the extent that the mom, you know, is coming forward, you're absolutely right, Anna. We've done a lot of these cases where you see the parents saying, oh my gosh, I love my baby, no matter how many people they've killed, right? Mm -hmm. I love my baby. They're a sweetheart. They're an angel. And we're all just looking at the parents like, are you crazy? You know, your child killed three or four people execution style, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, here, maybe just because they didn't have that like close, close bond over those 18 years, it just gives the mother an objective lens that a lot of times we see these parents who are just in public praising their killer children um, because they just subjectively can't get out of like the love and the bond that they've developed over the course of time that they've been raising them. That I mean, that's just one thing I could potentially think about this, but it doesn't excuse anything. I think this woman will be and deserves to be uh, sentenced to a very lengthy period of incarceration to think about what she did do. And maybe while she's incarcerated, she can get the psychological and therapeutic help that she needs to deal with whatever was there that allowed her to get involved in this plot. Right. Whatever she felt about being adopted or whatever else has gone in her life, she'll have more than enough time in prison to work it through. Do you think the fact that, you know, I absolutely believe that Darren, the one who plotted this whole thing, he absolutely is, you know, the center, the genesis of the evil here, without question. I want the book thrown at him, and it was. Yeah. And I am by no means excusing Denali, who should have known better. Mm -hmm. Do you think, though, in the sentencing part, Mm -hmm. do you think that at any point that she is considered a victim of this plot? I mean, she had many choices to not carry this out. You're right. I'm I mean, not defending her, her by any means. I know you're not. I mean, just from a defense standpoint, in terms of like yeah. putting forth a defense that via the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution she's entitled to, right? I think that's the angle, in addition to kind of what I discussed earlier, that they would explore. That like, yes, she was subject to a diabolical mind that, you know, adversely was able to influence her, maybe because of all of these other things that had gone on earlier in her life. It made her more vulnerable, right, to being taken advantage of and 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 put in this twisted plot and and ultimately carried out a very heinous plan, crime, and, and, and killing. Hmm. Now, in addition to this, 
because we don't know what the sentence is going to be for Denali. Denali and Darren, guy in the basement, both have pleaded guilty to conspiracy to produce child pornography. They did that on July 19th of last year, 2023. Here's why this is important. They haven't been sentenced yet on that, those right. separate issues. And they carry a 15-year mandatory minimum. Look, Darren's going to be in for 99 years. I don't think he's eligible for parole until like 45 years in. And then you put this, whether they do it concurrently or however they end up doing it, he's not getting out for a really long time. I don't Correct. think Denali's getting out anytime soon either. Correct. Um but it just shows you how big this case is, that it isn't just one thing. It's a multitude of crimes and offenses. Because remember, there's another victim out there, the person who was sexually assaulted and had it videotaped and sent to this creep. So there's another victim. So, I, you know, I, I, I sway back and forth. I'm like, mm, yeah, no, okay, no, throw the book, throw the book at these people. So on August 4th of 2023, Darren, the catfishing ringleader here of this fatal plot, pleaded guilty to one count of solicitation to murder. In exchange for the plea, the charges of first and second degree murder were dropped. So then on November 22nd of 2023, a lot was going on since we've been covering this. Caleb Leland, the one who lent the car that was used in the commission of this crime... Now, um, he thought, this is what he thought he was getting out of the deal. For $500,000, he lent the car. That was his interpretation of this deal. Yeah, so he pleaded guilty to one count of second degree murder in exchange for the plea. The charges of first degree and conspiracy were dropped. He's scheduled to be sentenced June 10th. So we, we still have people in various degrees of, of full prosecution here as far as sentencing we don't have everything and mm -hmm. um, so as we said on january 11th of this year darren was sentenced to the maximum of 99 years in prison will not be eligible for parole until the 45 years okay and um the judge said that he will always be a risk to this community i agree mm -hmm. i agree with that he reportedly showed no emotion when he was sentenced I don't know, probably not capable of it. And you know what? I do not blame Cynthia's father for saying to this, ugh, don't even want to call him a person, was led out after sentencing, I hope you rot in hell. That to me is actually measured, right? His response is actually quite controlled and measured. Yeah, At the very least, rot in hell. You and I can say that as parents. And and I think even before he rots in hell, let's just presume the next 45 years, even before parole eligibility, um, it's going to be hell on earth. You know, these are the types of offenses that, you know, when you end up incarcerated and you're walking around in the prison yard, you're walking around in the, you know, uh, mess hall or what have you, you know, <laughs> there's a political system in prison and they're going to want to see your papers. They're going to more specifically, what crime were you convicted of? Right. Because there's almost this kind of like informal ju judicial body within the prisons that when they find out what he did. Right. And what he carried out, um, it's, it's not going to be pretty for him in prison. I see him being probably in protective custody at some point for many, 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 many of those years alone not dealing with anyone it, it, it's going to be a terrible hellish 45 years because to put him out there on the yard when they find out what he did um he's going to have it uh, let's just say from a karma standpoint coming back to him daily yeah and that's what they say about karma don't they yeah yeah well caden mcintosh the alleged triggerman um he has pleaded not guilty we want to be clear here and he has yet to face trial or make any decisions otherwise. As you know, we will be following this case until there is complete justice for Cynthia. Boy, do we need a comment section today. We need to break this and just, just change the conversation. All right, time for the comment section. These are the cases, the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. And here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. 
Hey, Anna, how's it going? Good. Good to see you, Philip. Always well. Good to see you as well. All right. So uh, this one, I- I'm ca- I'm saying there's no place like home for a famous piece of movie memorabilia. This play, this case comes out of Duluth, Minnesota, where a man has been sentenced for the theft of Judy Garland's ruby slippers from the film The Wizard of Oz. Now, uh, the suspect here, Terry Martin, is now 76 years old, really up there. Uh, And, you you know, not to get too far ahead of the sentencing, but basically he's not going to receive any additional prison time after pleading guilty to the theft. Now, (laughs) interestingly enough, this case goes back to 2005 when this pair of slippers, they were stolen from Minnesota's Judy Garland Museum. She was born in Minnesota, kind of the pride of Minnesota. They got a a museum for her there. They were. I have been to this museum. Have you really? I have been to this museum. Because I, too, thought, what do you mean there's a museum here in Minnesota? Working for Crime Watch Daily, whenever I would have any downtime, you know, because I'm traveling back and forth, you know, from like from this to airport and you got to drive three hours. You'd be surprised if some of the places I stopped in along the way while covering a crime been there. Sorry, that's so I had to cool. interject. I, I, that's so cool. I love when, a you know, a place can have like a local <laughs> attraction like that for somebody I mean, like as monumentally iconic as as Judy Garland. Um, (laughs) So a a little bit about this heist from the museum. Uh, Apparently, Terry Martin uh, here, he was reportedly encouraged to do the crime by a mob associate. uh, And they thought, well, Terry was told that the slippers were encrusted with real rubies. And the plan was to take these gems out of the rubies and kind of part them off for money. It wasn't even about like the iconic slippers themselves. So... Terry, the suspect, had kind of a sorted a sorted pass with the law. He was convicted in 1988 on a felony charge of receiving stolen goods. However, prior to this 2005 heist, he, I, he allegedly had not committed a crime since 1996 when he was released. Mm. Uh, so going on a decade there prior to this. But yeah. he was first asked to do this caper. He, he tells the unnamed mob associate, no, he's you know, he's a different man now. But apparently this idea of like one final score just it it haunted him. It stayed with him. Uh, Terry's attorney uh, later said that like he was kept up at night thinking about this. So he ultimately has a relapse into his criminal ways. He agrees to do it. Like I said, in 2005, he successfully grabs the slippers from the museum. The rest obviously does not go as planned, as is common with movie props. A lot more majestic on camera than they are in real life. Uh, the famous slippers, they contain no rubies. The rubies are, they're made of glass. Um, so Terry finds this out. He now has no use for the slippers. He reportedly disposed of them something like two days after the heist. Uh, and when you say dispose, what do you mean by that? He just tossed them because he had no idea, he had no idea of the historical significance. He uh, reportedly had never seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz. So they were just junk to him at this point. He I just kind of gets rid of them. I um, can't. <laughs> a note on this specific pair of slippers. These are actually one of four pairs that were actually worn by Garland in the film. Well, I was gonna say that. It, was there only one pair at the museum? I thought I had seen a pair while I was there. I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah, so there is. So there are four, there's four known pairs or still four existing pairs that are out there in the world. Now, three of the pairs the pairs uh, technically belong to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Oh, okay. One pair is on display in LA. One is at the Smithsonian. And then another one is like reportedly in possession of an anonymous collector. So, you know, this pair was so special because it was at, you know, the titular uh, Judy Garland Museum. Um, so things, you know, this stuff happens in 2005. Things go kind of cold for a while, right? And then... In 2017, the FBI gets involved <laughs> with local police, um, and, and it's not just about these slippers, right? Um, a- apparently, the FBI was investigating a scheme to defraud a corporation which owns the slippers, and uh, apparently, it all comes back to this. They find the slippers in 2018, uh, and and they've been returned. Wait a minute. Yes. You said that he tossed them in the trash, and now you yeah. say they've been returned. I have no idea. I like that. That part is unclear to me. It took the FBI to figure that out. I would guess somewhere along the, the way, right? Like um, somebody saw these. Somebody found these. Like it, it's, oh my God. it's it's such like um, I mean, even if you were to see a pair of ruby slippers in the trash, even not knowing the Wizard of Oz, don't you think you would take a look? Oh, I would take them. I would absolutely. I, I love would, to take I've, things from the trash. You see this red say, lamp? I, I, 
This is red trash. Okay, so my mother, now you, Philip will understand this. I grew up in Queens, you know, in an apartment building, right? And a big thing to do is everywhere, like people put their trash out. Oh yeah. This lamp, my mother found <laughs> in the trash. And when she passed, I carefully transported this lamp to my home here and I had it rewired. This is my I favorite lamp it. on the entire freaking planet. I love it. From like from the trash. trash to an heirloom. See what that's, I mean? That's perfect. God, that's God bless mom. God bless right? mom. New York trash, it's it's a different kind of treasure. You can really find some gold just yes. parked out, out on the street waiting for the Department of Sanitation yes. to come pick it up. So yeah, I'm not mad at your mom at all. No. no. I, I can't say we have done that from time to time. So Absolutely. We are no, not there's ashamed. nothing wrong with that. We'll that's, take that's, someone else's trash. That's Come on upcycling. Now. That's York. upcycling. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I had to because... No, I love it. Um, this means everything. <laughs> so, Terry here, he pleads guilty. Uh, sentencing, like I said, just, just happened uh, here recently. But in kind of a rare occurrence, Terry's defense attorney and prosecutors agreed that the man should only receive time served due to his age. Like I said, he's in his late 70s, and apparently his health is ailing. Um, so in the end, Terry was ultimately sentenced to time served with one year of probation. He was also ordered to pay $25,000 in reparations to the Judy Garland Museum. Um, so yeah, it, apparently his health is, is really in poor shape. So we'll, we'll I, I, who knows what's gonna happen with that. But it, it seems like he feels bad about it. Um, I think the right thing to do would probably have just been left him on the doorstep of the museum or something though. absolutely um yeah uh, with, i don't know with the heels prepared for clicking Come yes on. <laughs> yeah 100 percent. uh so we got a lot of comments on this one i i gotta i, I gotta know because i put in the headline uh glass slippers because i was intending that you know they're not real rubies they're made out of glass got a lot of comments people correcting me uh danae said slippers weren't glass they were ruby cinderella had the glass ones that's my bad. I, oh I, my I God, Will! There. Really? I know. I mean, I know. you're like this guy. How do you? You need. You need to know the difference with these things. I know. I have. I like. I've lost a lot of credibility. With Will's yeah. my five year old so. daughter heard what you just said. You have some oh. problems, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta keep. Like, I gotta don't... keep my my. Well, does Dorothy count as a princess? I I don't know how that works. Ooh, that's a complicated area. Because I was gonna say I gotta keep my princesses straight. I don't know if she counts or if she's a whole different thing. Um, Icon. But in any event, they're just I, all icons. Like they're it. icons. I like that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I gotta, I, I gotta keep those together. Um, this actually brought up a nostalgic memory for Trisha R. They said, "Who remembers when they sold these sequins ones in department stores as a kid in the '90s?" Um, I don't super remember this, but I, I feel like there either. are. I feel like we go through little phases where every once in a while, like they become kind of popular again. You see kids wearing like the the ruby kind of red things, mm -hmm. which you know you could do worse. You could do worse as far as uh, as far as fashion goes. Uh, <laughs> K86 uh, was upset at this at a different reason. They said, I'm more in shock. He's never seen the movie. I, yes. I don't know, especially if you're like 76 right at now. At his I, age, yeah, it would have been on television all the time. Th yeah, like that's squarely in your, Before your like, cable. cultural reference point. <laughs> right. I, Before I streaming. Like. I mean, at one point, wasn't that probably the only movie that was showing at the movie theater Con in your town? Yeah, just constantly on television all the time. <laughs> Um, all right, Molson Man said Dorothy could have made it back home to Kansas a lot sooner had it not been for this thief. Uh, they added Uncle Henry and Auntie M want the book thrown at this guy, and rightfully so. Yes, and um, Toto too. <laughs> well, we actually got to end this one on a par, uh, on, on a pun rather. Allison R said, "What a Toto waste of time for the investigators." Um, I, I, I would be inclined to agree, except for I feel like this kind of only fell together as part of a larger investigation. I, I, right. I don't think they were, I don't think they were putting the big bucks into the the, the ruby red slipper operation. But who, who knows? Who knows? Uh, but that'll do it for this week's comment section. Thank you so much to everybody who left those. You can do that over on our YouTube community page. You can also reach out to us anytime or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We love to hear from you. Uh, that'll do it for me. Until next week, have a good one. Bye, Will. Philip, it has been such a pleasure to have you on. I always love to hear your insight. And I got to say, Philip, it's so refreshing, you know, to hear you as a criminal defense attorney say, I'd never take that case. Yeah, that one, too evil for me. Just can't defend. Man, it was a benefit of coming out into private practice, right? They, there's a lot of autonomy and decision making on 
what morally and philosophically you will move on. Certainly systemically, there are times where we do have to come in and rightly, rightfully defend a lot of people. There are certain cases we're just not going to take. And you and I, just as dark as we had to go today in these facts, um, certainly, too, that we're closing the door on if they come into the office. So, I appreciate that a lot, Philip. I really do. I really do. So thank you. Where can people find you, follow you on social media or if they ever need an attorney? <laughs> no, absolutely. We are we are in New York, 48 Wall Street. Um, mm, look at that address. OK, so, yeah, if you happen to be in the financial district in Manhattan, certainly, uh, you know, ring the bell. And uh, across social media platforms, you can find me at ESQ, like Esquire, ESQ Hamilton, at ESQ Hamilton. Love it. Love following you. Love seeing your beautiful family, your kids. Just, you know, my best to Lance as well. And Sean, haven't seen Sean in a long time. How's Sean doing? Oh. Our rugby player. No, no, no. Every, everybody's doing well. I will make sure to give your love uh, when I see them. Yeah, yeah. Huge fans of your firm. <laughs> the New York guys. We love you. We love, love, you. love, love. I'm always back. Uh, you can find me at Anna G News on all social media. That's Anna with one N. You can find this episode, all episodes of our podcast. We've got more than 300 of them. So we can uh, keep you busy for a while on a long drive. Uh, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where we're really interactive and love to hear your thoughts on justice and on the cases. You can sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm Anna Garcia, the host of True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.